Welcome to Broad Ideas. Hello, Thank guys. Thank you, Rachel. Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, so today, first of all, October is the National Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. So we have an episode. First, we would like to acknowledge that we talk about things that could potentially be triggering. It's very open and honest and vulnerable and beautiful, but we just want to put that out there um, before you listen. But we really encourage everyone to listen to this beautiful human, Libby Weintraub, who is one of Olivia's best friends, came to tell her story and share her story with us and wrote a book. And it's really an incredible journey and story and perspective and all of it. So we encourage you to stay on the line. <laughs> um, and uh, it really, it stayed with me for a long time after. And it will. And it will. I think it might do the same. So let's have Libby. Sometimes when about dogs and kids and things we'll talk about chicks and tampon strings we'll talk about boys that make you cry we'll talk about death because people die you know you know yeah. what, you know what happened this morning i was getting ready it was so funny yeah. I, was, I was like i felt nervous yesterday but then i was like oh my god they're so amazing like we're going to talk about all these incredible things and and then this morning when i got up i felt like i was like you know how you feel. What do you call? You know, you know when you miss miss school. What is it when you play miss, hooky? Yeah, yeah. Like we call it wagging in Australia. Oh, like when you're wagging <laughs> when you when you wag school. Yeah, but I felt like I was gonna be wagging school. Like like I should be like like coming here. You're wagging. Yeah, like school. we're gonna smoke cigarettes. Yeah, and just like <laughs> do bad things. Do, do tequila and you smoke cigarettes. You're like I'm gonna get like, into trouble. I was like, shouldn't I be going to work? Like, and then I was like, no, this is work. This, this is your is. work. Yeah, but this that's what you get to do now. See, that's Libby. Right there, though. Yeah. Is, this is your work. Th this is your work. Yeah. And this is your work. Yeah. This is our work. This is your work. Yeah. Having these conversations. Yeah. Having these moments. For where, sure. Yeah. We've had quite a few recently that mm -hmm. have been... Next level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like as we keep getting further and further into it, the conversations mm. keep going further and further. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's just... It's been like really therapeutic. And emotional mm. and humorous, you know, everything. But mm. for you to be able to come here and sit down with us today and talk mm. about everything is huge. And thank you for being so open and beautiful. And I'm so happy to finally meet you. And mm. Me too. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but obviously, so you and Olivia have known each other a long time. Yeah. A How decade. A decade now. A decade. Yeah. 2012 we met. Yeah. Because I've met, been with Jeff yeah. 10 years. Mm-hmm. You met at USM. And it all happened at yeah. USM. Yeah. Yeah. I amazing. remember. Yeah. So tell, um, maybe just Yeah, so we went to USM. school together. We went to USM together. And I remember Libby stood up and shared. And I was like, what the fuck <laughs> is that? Because it was like, <laughs> I wasn't used to hearing people share so honestly and authentically mm. and from their heart and soul yet. Mm. Like, now we're getting used to it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But back then, I remember like really wanting to experience people in that way. And you were one of the first people you stood up and mm -hmm. shared. And I remember just being mind blown that you were sharing from the depths of your soul mm -hmm. in front of a room full of 200 people you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's a big deal. And yeah. then she invited us back to her house. <laughs> and we a went. Lot. To, yeah, she's like, come to my house and have lunch. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> and like we went and it was like this gorgeous, like it was another extension of her. And I was like, oh my, I remember feeling like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be mm. in this world mm. because of that experience. I remember mm. putting my bare feet on your grass yeah. and like we, it was just next level, yeah. like depth and incense and flowers. And <laughs> yeah, I like to create like 
I think that's one of my like gifts. One of the things I love more than anything is is um, playing with a currency of beauty. Mm. Playing with a currency of beauty and like what 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 does it mean to live a beautiful life? Um, and and more than just like the objects that we surround ourselves with, which are really important because they all hold energy and frequency. But like how to how to let that beauty come out more and more. And I think what I'm realizing as I get older, because when I was younger, I thought beauty was everything to do with the outside. Mm. I really didn't understand that there that 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 you can touch into a different quality of beauty through grief, mm -hmm. through loss, yeah. through opening your mouth in a classroom with over two hundred fifty people <laughs> and just pouring your heart out. And I think, yeah. You know, just to give some background about USM, it is um, the only school in the world. It's currently closed now, so everything's online. That teaches a program, a master's program in spiritual psychology. So I don't know what brought you to the program, but I sort of, I was at a, I was really lost. I was really lost. I was really searching for what was next. I think I've been a searcher my whole life trying to understand like why I'm here and what's my purpose and um and I've gone down so many avenues like I left home when I was 17 and I moved to Tokyo I got a very big contract with an agency there $45,000 at 17 years old oh my god and I'm like great I'm getting out of school <laughs> <laughs> you're wanking is that what you're wagging wagging, oh, wagging. Oh, wagging. <laughs> wagging. <laughs> maybe no, some of that that, too, that but... means something else I don't know what that means <laughs> yeah, yeah that means something else um <laughs> yeah no I was just like I, I yeah even as a kid I was like just you know things were difficult we we, we didn't grow up with a lot of money like it's we grew up with like there were moments where we like really struggled as a family. Like I remember mom telling me dad was working away once and like the company hadn't sent the money into the account. So like she would sell, she sold furniture so we could eat. So there, there's been these moments of like, like real hardship. But um, I had a very strong desire at a very young age to get out of that space, to mm -hmm. carve out a place for myself and, just to follow that thread and, you know, someone took pictures of me and they ended up at an agency and then I met the agency and then had really long hair, like maybe cut it all off and, oh my ooh, goodness. and started taking pictures. And, and then I ended up, you know, I, I got this contract and went overseas, came back home, went to London, came back home, went to Paris, went, went to Milan, kept meeting all these women from New York and I was like, oh, I have to go to New York. Mm. Something was calling me to New York, went to New York, came to LA, went back to New York, mm -hmm. met my husband. And it was just like this oh, wow. moment of just like following that thread, mm -hmm. not knowing where it was going to lead me, just but just following that, following that thread. And then, you know, we we lived in New York together for 15 years and we're like, let's, we want to start a family, you know, let's. And, and then I was like, well, I'm not raising them in New York. And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, never. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All the cars and the horns and the pollution. And, like, I grew up, like, in the bush. Right. In a, in literally in the bush, like, with kangaroos and oh goannas goodness. and, like, all kinds of things surrounding this new development where my parents had bought a piece of land and were building a house. And so we were, like, 15 minutes from the beach and we lived in the bush, and it was like I wanted that for my kids. I You're like, my... so Los Angeles is yeah. the bush. <laughs> 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 it's as close to the bush as I can get. He's like, I can't move to Australia. He's in the music business, so he's like all of his work is based here. We have a lot of friends here, so it just made sense to make a move. So yeah. we moved, and like and then we moved his mom, and then I started the the class. But I was in that place of like I wasn't modeling anymore. I'd been a, you know, a private uh, raw food vegan mm. chef. Oh, wow. Teaching about detoxification and healing for six years. And then, and then I was like, what's, what's my next move? Am I going to keep doing that here in LA? It seemed like the appropriate place to yeah, be doing health and sure. wellness. <laughs> yeah. And then my doctor introduced me to the work at USM, the University of Santa Monica. And I just signed up and it was very powerful. 
Um, and I fell in love with Olivia immediately. Olivia and another friend, Casey. Yeah, and Casey, yeah. Got up and she was, I was, uh, and I had that same feeling. I was like, oh, who is she? <laughs> <laughs> who is that girl? You know, because she just went so deep. And that's what I yearn for. Yeah. That's why I sort of when I was tuning in to your show, I, was, I left a message with Olivia the other day. There's this currency of vulnerability. Like I know it's like fun and playful and everything, mm-hmm. but that's almost sort of like a little seduction into like, yeah, we're going to get yeah, into those Yeah, bits. but we're going to go there. <laughs> get into those little bits. We'll start up here and For then sure. we'll get into those bits. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I think we're living in an age where we can't really afford to skim the surface anymore. Mm. We just can't. I mean, yeah. our world is changing so much. I drive by the streets and there's those little robots delivering food oh everywhere. Oh, my God. It's like drives I me know. crazy. I just want to kick them. I'm like, <laughs> where, where? I know. The first time I the saw human- one, I was like, what the fuck is that? Yes. So creepy. It's so weird. And you look back on the sh- like the Jetsons. I don't know if you mm-hmm. know, you know, yeah, when they're like predicting, they're like, oh, this literally is everything that's yeah. now. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, yeah, you're flying cars. You know, they got a car that can fly. You're like, yeah, stay on the fucking ground. Yeah. yeah. Like, let us all just stay. What about Grounded. FaceTime? I was like, that was never, oh, yeah. that's never going to happen. Never going to happen. Yeah. And then yeah. we're like, hello. <laughs> yeah. Every second. Like, so should I order these? Like, or do you want this cup here? Yeah. Like, it's just so yeah. accessible. Everything's so accessible. Yeah. You it's know? It's kind of a bit, it's kind of a bit. Kind Much. Of just, it's a bit disgusting. Yeah. Like, let's just At times. Honest. Yeah. At times. I yeah. mean, the convenience is great, but For it's sure. like this technology is wonderful, but like how are we using it and what's the end game? Like, because I feel like we've gotten so far removed from nature our yeah. natural environment like you said just taking your shoes off and putting your feet on the ground how recentering that can be just the simple act of coming home to yourself through taking off your shoes and reconnecting with yeah with the ground with but the earth that's what your home does and that's what you create like mm. i really i'm going to set this up like we need to just go spend some time and it's at like you Libby's. You have to go to Libby's because house. when you <laughs> it, it's, do it, it's a healing experience. Mm. From the time you walk in the door and you take off your shoes, it's that feeling of like everything's good mm. in this world. It was so funny. Mm. One of these nights recently, I yeah. came home from your house and I told Jeff, I was like, he was like, "What did you guys do?" I said, "Oh, we had this gorgeous salad and da da da." And he goes, "Okay." I'm going to say this right now. The only gorgeous salad that you're ever going to eat is at Libby's house. <laughs> said that? Yeah. Because he's like, salads aren't gorgeous. He's like, but you were at Libby's house. So it's a gorgeous salad. So it's salad. a gorgeous salad. <laughs> yeah. Because she like, like she, it's like she makes love to the lettuce. Yeah, like yeah. she doesn't, you know what I mean? There's, everything is just so so intentional it's intention. and then yeah. she'll come over and like give you a foot rub <laughs> oh my god i'm not kidding <laughs> no, I, love, I don't know i love it maybe it's like a past life it's an it's a, it's an experience like you feel healed in her home yeah, in her healing. presence <laughs> in her soup oh I, my god. I said i was like we had this amazing it's like life changing soup. <laughs> <laughs> but like how amazing if life could be more like that. And yeah, could, like yeah. that's a possibility that exists for us all that we can slow down enough to be that present with our touch, with the you know, making our food. And that was part of the training, like where I did my training. We had to be very intentional with the food because people were coming to the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center for healing. Mm. So if you were in the kitchen and we would sage the kitchen every morning and gather together all the chefs and set an intention for the energy that we would bring forward into the food that day. And if at any moment throughout the day you weren't feeling right or you got frustrated, you were asked to leave the kitchen. Wow. Mm. To walk the property or to go and sit, have a tea, and then come back. Wow. Because with the raw food, you're working with like a super high water content in the food. And water, as you know, most of us are sort of getting familiar with, can hold a vibrational frequency. Right. So when people are eating that, you're sort of bringing that energy into your body. But the level of integrity in this center was like unlike anything I've ever experienced. Wow. So I carry that with me into everything that I'm doing. You know, and there are moments where I'm not in that place and I I really feel it. Yeah. I feel it. You can feel it when someone's really with you and really mm-hmm. present mm-hmm. and when, when they're not. Yeah. 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 And are you – so if we go back to USM, let's say, 
Yeah. I want to know what was your biggest takeaway from that, hmm. from that experience? It was a two-year program. Yeah. yeah. Um, that I'm enough, hmm. just as I am. And that was a biggie for me because I'd been like really searching for myself everywhere, like in the modeling and in the, the next job, the next photographer when I work for that magazine, when I shoot with that photographer. But it was this always this, this feeling of emptiness. You know, if I lose this much weight, if I get more toned and more fit, then I'll get more jobs, then I'll feel more. And it was just this endless cycle of searching and the emptiness always remained. Mm. And it wasn't until really the work at USM where I turned to that emptiness and welcomed it sort of as a teacher, like there's something in here for me to look at because I've tried this, 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 and this diet and this job and this, and I still didn't feel connected. And so it was, it was just the, you know, this feeling of like I'm enough as I am um, that was a big one for me. Um, and I still struggle with that. You know, that'll circle back around for me a lot. But there's this knowingness now that there's a place inside of myself that I can turn to and be fully resourced from that place. And it's like, I mean, you could call it your spirit or your soul or God, or it's just, it's for me, it's an energy. It's, mm. a, it's a very calm, stabilizing current of energy. And I've touched into it in meditation. I've touched into it into yoga. But it's not exclusively limited to those things because, again, that was another thing. Well, when I do my meditation, I'm going to feel that thing. And oh, when I do my yoga, I'm going to mm. feel that thing. But it's like I can get that feeling when I'm making food too. I can get that feeling like even now just with with you. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a feeling that's available to us. It's an energy. It's a knowingness. It's an intelligence that's always there, that's ever present. And I think sort of USM was the lead into um, my preparation for what was to come next, you know, because that was a two-year program. We went really deep and we both got pregnant at like literally within weeks of one another. There oh were five God. women in the class that got pregnant literally like Within weeks, of I don't one think another. I got pregnant until after you gave birth. Really? No. I thought you were pregnant in the class. No. Okay, then. So, but there I were didn't other get pregnant women. until after graduation. It was Chica and okay, um, maybe like, Sarah Gibbons. Yeah, or, there were a few others. Few others that all got, all pregnant, got pregnant the same yeah. year. But was, I know I okay. didn't until until after. Okay, and that that's one of the things that like if you're open to talking about yeah because you wrote a book obviously yeah um yeah in october right is it october this yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah october so is, october is what uh, national pregnancy and infant loss yeah. awareness month so yeah. if we can talk about that that you know mm -hmm. obviously Rachel I've shared with you Libby's experience but it's I'm I'm just crying. <laughs> you're crying like it's just Well, it's been one of um obviously for you mm -hmm. the most life-changing experience of your life, but yeah. also so many people around you that love you so deeply. Mm. And Scooter and mm. everyone that's been through this with you. But yeah. if you can tell us a little bit about Magnolia. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. It's been a pretty um, mind-bending, <laughs> earth-shattering, like, experience. Um, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity to speak about it because so many women don't. It's not really invited and it's a very uncomfortable place to be in when you're surrounded by friends who are pregnant and giving birth and you're pregnant and you're giving birth to your baby but she's not alive you know so um yeah there were there were so many levels and layers to that experience for me but to just sort of 
tether it back to USM, I don't think without without the skills, without the the framework, without the context in which they gave us a, a new way of looking at life, a new way of looking at our challenges, a new way of looking at devastation, a new way of looking at death. Like without without that that framework, I I wouldn't be sitting here today. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that not like, I mean, I, I really, really would not be sitting right. here today. Like, I, I don't know if I would actually be here today. Right. Because the grief was so intense, because the loss was so intense. It's like there are moments where it just, you feel like you're being literally ripped limb from limb. Like, like you can't even imagine carrying life inside of your being your body that into the intimacy that you're forming with that child and all the love that you and your partner have for that child and then just the emptiness of there's nowhere to put that like where does that go if she's not here um (sighs) where does it go like what do what do you do with that love you know what do you do with that longing what do you do and so it was this process of like really trying to figure out like who are we now right. who am i what is this what is this what do i do with this now that i'm not going to mother in this way that i that I hoped and dreamed to mother in, you know, like, um, and so having the framework of school was really helpful and it didn't ease the pain. It didn't make it easier, but it, it helped. There was, there was like a flickering light off in the distance that I could touch into at times when it got really, 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 really dark, really dark. Um, so just for some background, um, I got pregnant in class. I miscarried my first pregnancy. I got pregnant in the first year, miscarried that. That was devastating. I remember. How far along? Eight, eight weeks. So okay. still still early. Yeah. But it like but it brought weeks. up. Yeah. It just brought up all this stuff around feeling worthless and there's something wrong with me. And I didn't really understand that, like, that's just a natural part of the body adjusting to this new phase, you know, like so many things have to line up in order for a pregnancy yeah. to take a hold mm-hmm. and then to be carried to term. So that gave me a lot of material to work with just inside of myself. Um, and then I got pregnant again carried magnolia to full term so it was um a few days before my due date and I was up late at night the night before she died and um just in my office looking at lists of what I gotta do and what I gotta have and what I you know gotta we gotta buy that and just all the things that you think you need to be like a good mum like (laughs) all the things yeah you know and really in the end to be yeah the end all you need is like your boob a blanket, yeah. a diaper, <laughs> you know, like right. the You're basics. Like, oh, but the new, like, high-tech, whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's like all, all the, the stuff. Things. Yeah. Broad Ideas is supported by Talkspace. Do you think seeing a therapist or psychiatrist would be helpful, but you don't have the time to actually find one and meet with them or afford them? Try Talkspace. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. When you've met your therapy goals or simply want to cancel, Talkspace has a simple cancellation process and will work with you to get a prorated refund for unused time if applicable. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. Therapy can help you shift your perspective, find tools to cope in difficult times, and be a guiding light. Talkspace can help with any specific challenges you might be facing. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and much more. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com ideas. 
To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash ideas to get $80 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash ideas. Broad Ideas is supported by Brooklinen. Brooklinen knows a thing or two about tricks and treats in the bedroom, mattresses on the floor, and navy sheets, definitely tricks, luxury linens that stand the test of time. Now that's a treat, and Brooklinen has enough to go around. Sweaty, bad dreams after watching that scary Halloween movie? I know I do. Luckily, Brooklinen offers a whole fleet or sheet of options from linen to flannel to accommodate all sleepers, cool, hot, and everything in between. Use those old sheets for your ghost costume and upgrade to Brooklinen seasonal picks for linens as well as top of bed bath and more. I loved sleeping in my Brooklinen sheets. I had a nice, cool evening. No scary sweats from that horrific Halloween movie that I'm forced to watch every year. And I feel well rested. It's no trick. Brooklinen's best selling linens are sure to curb those seasonal scaries this fall. Visit in store or online at brooklinen.com and use code BROAD for $20 off your online order of $100 or more. That's B R O O K L I N E N.com, promo code BROAD for $20 off. And I just drove myself crazy. I was up making lists and and my mum was coming the next morning from Australia to come and help take care of Magnolia. Um, and Steve was like, come to bed. What are you doing? You know, like his <laughs> voice just sort of echoed down the stairs like, this is crazy. You need to sleep. And and this is one thing I kept promising myself as I got closer. I'm gonna, this week I'm going to do nothing. This week right. I'm going to do nothing. This week. But there was always something, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and in hindsight it was it was, you know, it is what it is, but it was probably some part of me and you probably knew what was coming, you know, mm, like some yeah. part was sort of preparing. So I was very distracted making my list and I, I walked upstairs, I think it was like around 2.30 in the morning, got into bed, closed my eyes, laid, laid in bed, and then m- mom was arriving at 8 in the morning. We had a car pick her up and bring her, and then I had an appointment at 9 a.m., at the doctor's office, not my OBG, just another practitioner I was seeing who mm-hmm. does like body work mm-hmm. and he was a d- trained doula. And so I went to my appointment with my mom and I'm like in the lobby waiting and I like go to the restroom and then I get up and I look in the toilet bowl and there's all this blood and I was like, fuck what the fuck is happening? And then I was like, you know, this is my first full-term pregnancy, so I'm thinking maybe I'm in labour. Like, you know, they say when your cervix opens, if there's a blood vessel there, there can be blood. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so I I flush the toilet, I go outside and I'm standing there talking to um, my doctor and uh, I can just feel all this warmth Mm. pouring into my underwear and I'm standing there and I'm like, Give, just give me a second. Give me give me a second. And I go back in again and I just sit on the toilet. I get back up and there's more blood. And I'm just like, fuck. Fuck. Like, what what is this? You know, and I like go out and I was like, hey, Dr. Berlin, can you come and take a look at this? Like, I'm not sure what's going on. And he comes in and he's like, oh, oh, wow. Um, yeah, we need to call your doctor and we need to call your midwife. And my mom is just sort of like delirious. She's off like a 30-hour flight and I can see she's like panicked. Mm. But I'm still like I'm still like not really in my body, like I'm not really sort of understanding what's happening. So um, I rang my husband who was at home in bed and um, I said, hey, we're we, – uh, something's going on. I don't know what's happening with baby. We have to go and check on her. So he said, call me when you get to the doctor's office. So we're driving to the doctor's office and I called Alicia Hayes on the yeah. way over and she said, what's going on? And I was like, I don't know. And she said, where's Steve? And I said, home. And she said, is he alone? And I said, yeah. And she's like, we're going to get Michael. We're going to go over, yeah. let us know what's going on. That's so her get, husband, Michael yeah. Hayes. Yeah, and um, so we I get to the doctor's office and 
they still got all their Halloween like stuff hanging and I was like this is so weird it was like walking into like a weird yeah movie or something and like the nurse that gr- greeted me was like really I could feel like she was like really nervous and I'm like what the fuck is happening and I look up and there's like this little witch hanging from the ceiling on her broom and it says be very afraid what is be very afraid <sighs> and I'm like be very afraid and it's just, it was just like sort of like everything was in slow motion and then they wanted to put this band around my belly to check if I was having contractions and I'm, I'm like, I'm not fucking having contractions. Right. I'm not having any contractions. I'm bleeding like I have, I have like a little hand towel rolled up in my jeans and then they walk, you know, the my doctor who was, you know, supposed to be there to deliver is get at the airport, getting on a flight to go for Thanksgiving to visit his family. Hmm. So his colleague is seeing me to do the ultrasound and we're in there in the room doing the ultrasound and, like, I'm looking on the screen and I can see her head and I could see her spine and I can see her arms and I can see I can see her. But he's taking, like, a really long time and I'm just, like, laying there looking at her on the screen and I'm like he's taking a really long time and then I'm like looking at my mom and I'm like oh shit oh no like and I was like are you looking for her heartbeat aren't you and he said yeah 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 and he's like moving it around and I was like it's it's not beating, is it? It's not. And he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And it was just like my mom let out this howl, like this howl of like, like panic and loss and like, and I just turned to her and I remember holding her and I was thinking, this is the realest fucking thing I've ever experienced in my whole life. And all that, you got to have the car seat, got to have the blanket, got to get those little shoes, got to get those, like that part of me that was up making lists, like that panicked part that just needed to control everything, that fell away. And it was just dead quiet like it was silence silence and it was just it was the most surreal feeling because on one hand I'm being told that my daughter's dead and I know I'm gonna have to give birth to her and on the other hand there's this peace and quiet and stillness that Mm. I've never experienced in my whole life wow so there's these two experiences coexisting simultaneously and I'm just in this state of like not denial of what's happened but like this is fucking real this is fucking life this is this is right. my life now this is what's here before me there's no past there's no present there's nothing it's like uh, it's like like i got pulled right into the present moment it's like someone throwing a bucket of cold ice on you you know and being in a daze and then waking the fuck up and 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 then I just was like I hugged my mom the doctor was sort of talking and talking and his voice just sort of like faded into the background (laughs) and I'm like like I gotta call my husband now I gotta call Scooter I gotta call Steve I gotta I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, gotta tell him. I gotta tell him. I have to tell him that, like, our little girl is like gone. Like, she's not here. Like, and so I, I like, we, he moved us into the other room, and it was just like this. This part of me came online where I was like, okay, this is this is what's happening. 
picked up the phone, I called him. I was so scared to tell him. But he picked up the phone right as Alicia and Michael had arrived at the house. And so they were there to hold space for him, you know, when he received the news. They cleaned out the house. They took all the baby stuff and they, like, put it in the garage. And then they headed to the doctor's office. And we all just held hands and got in a circle and just prayed, you know, for for the delivery and, yeah, that it would be, you know, we would be received with compassion and we would be received with love and that we could take our time. And so it literally just from the moment I found out and then I called Steve, they arrived. And it was just like this, like I was saying, this part of me came online that was just like, and I don't know if it was like shock or it was like, like I said, someone throwing a bucket of ice on you and it's like you're like, or someone slapping you around the face or a gun going off. It's like, it's, right. you know, the house is on fire and you have to get out. You know, it's like you go to the nearest exit. But there was some part of me that, that now was like, okay, this is what we're doing. You know what that is? What is that? That's mother. That is the mother. Like in oh. you, that is yeah. all the maternal, like everything. That's mommy. And that's what that was. Because there's times where you have to just, no matter what, mm. and that's the direction, and you're a mom. Mm. And that's what I believe. That's what that was in that moment. Because there's nothing in my experience in life, like there's nothing like being a mother, you know? And like that's just what you tune into because nothing else matters. Thank you for bringing that back around because like I've lived my life for the last nine years in some senses not feeling like a mother. Oh, you are <laughs> you, the you. most phenomenal, biggest mother, like I've ever sat in front of, mm-hmm. like, because in that moment, how you handled it, that's being a mother. Yeah. And we went, we got in the car, I got on my <gasps> phone, I write this beautiful message. I sent it to everyone. Like, this is what's happening. This is, this is our life now. Please send us light. Please light candles. Don't reach out. We'll, we'll, you know, we got to the hospital. They were so nice to us. We went into the room. We turned all the lights off. We we made it our own space. And again, that 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 quiet, that stillness, that presence, it stayed with me like the whole time. I'm I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna make this the most beautiful fucking labor that's ever been. <laughs> this is gonna be fucking beautiful. <laughs> Cause she's my girl. Yeah. She's my baby. You know, like we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. We're going to drop in and, like, I, I have all these photos that my midwife took and there's this beautiful one of me just sort of laying on the on the maternity, on the bed, and I've just got my hands on her and I'm just in this, like, you look at my face and it's like, has she been meditating for, like, six hours? It's just like this, <laughs> <laughs> just this like, peace and calm. Because finally that part of me that had been like trying to control the whole situation, like there was no room for her anymore. Like that fell away. And like what what came forward and up and underneath that is is like you said, is mother. Mm-hmm. Is mother. Yeah. And I was like, and it's so funny because up until that point I'd, I'd never been like, I need this and I need that. Can you get me this? Can you get me that? You know, and I right. remember – Someone going, whoa, you were just like so directional yep. with mm-hmm. everything. You handled it. Like, yeah. You know, you yeah. advocated for you. You advocated for her. Yeah. And that's what it is. Strong yeah. like a mother. I mean, it's a saying for a yeah. reason, you know? Yeah. And so many so many people were like, well, you, you gave birth to her? <sighs> you mean you mean you, you actually, like you gave birth labored to her? And labor, birth. You yeah. labored and did the whole thing. Yeah. I was like uh yeah <laughs> what you, mm-hmm. what just cut me open because she's not alive like bypass that experience I mean so you know that's some that's inevitable for some mothers that's yeah, part right. of the journey but like no <laughs> yeah I gave birth to her 
I, I'd labor like every other mother would labor. I yeah. took the fucking drugs. I was so like, I'm not going to take drugs. I'm going to have her at home. I'm going to have all this beautiful music playing in the background. <laughs> I watched all these videos. Yeah. This one of this like woman having an orgasm while she, I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> that's so ridiculous. <laughs> oh, oh my God. You know, like, yeah. The journey, it's like that's the thing, like as a mum, right, it's like there's two people involved in this dance. It's you and your child and, you know, you can have all the good intentions you want about where you want to have it and what song's going to be playing when they're crowning and like (laughs) what sort of incense you'll be burning and like all that stuff. That's fine. Like have your vision, do your thing. But like be open to a pivot. Oh, yeah. Be open to a pivot because – Sometimes for the well-being of that child, a pivot is required. Mm -hmm. And it's just that's one of the things that I'm really wanting to bring into the conversation now in in regards to mothering Mm -hmm. and birth, childbirth, is like where's the middle lane? Right. Where's the middle path, right? You're either in the hospital camp or the home birth camp is what I've found. There's very much you're in this lane or you're in that lane and there's no real sort of like sober discussion around well what's the middle path right if it's not going to be this it's like yeah. no 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 don't want to talk about that right oh, oh, right oh, i want to have my home birth i want to have my birth, birth, birth. Yeah. you know or like i want to have my hospital birth like I don't want to, you it's know, one or the like, other right but there's like so much that we can can be married together of those two paths that would create a middle path that would empower a mother to be like, I, I don't have to be afraid and scared and therefore opt into hospital mm-hmm. right away because what I've been told. And I don't have to necessarily be dead set on home birth, even though that's probably, you know, some women prefer that. That's the route I wanted. I wanted to be in my own home with my own food and my own yeah. bed. And like that just felt like if I could do that safe, which is why I got a doctor and a midwife, right. then that that would be my ideal choice. But there was a part of me that was like very a- arrogant and very naive and very like, no, 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 I'm having my home birth. Right. You know, all my friends had, Jackie yeah. had it, Alice yeah. had it, blah, blah, blah. All these like friends had it. So that's what I want. And it's like, well, but maybe that's not what you're meant to get. Like, right. that's right. There is another person involved in this equation called yeah. your child. And there's a feedback loop, right, between the mother and the child. And so, the thing that I'm really curious about wanting to sort of put in the space more around these conversations is like how do we strengthen that feedback loop between mother and baby? Mm, right. and, and before we get to that, you have to we have to look at the conversation of how do we strengthen that feedback loop between our own inner knowing yeah. and our body. Like we live with these decisions that we make. Like just because someone's been a doctor for 30 years, fine, mm. great. I honour the time that you've put in. But like where is my inner knowing coming into the equation? Mm-hmm. And it's like, like even if I look like a crazy, needy lunatic, like who gives a fuck? Yeah, like if right. my body's saying something's not right, yeah. I-, I need to honour that yeah. regardless of what the midwife's saying, regardless of what the doctor's saying, no, yeah. regardless of what the nurse is saying. So how do we empower one another to just really – like learn how to like sit in that place and trust that wisdom that's coming through. Magnolia was breech a couple of weeks before she was born. And the reason why I chose the doctor that I chose because he does vaginal breech. It's like that's he's one of the oh, wow. top doctors in the country, one of the only doctors in the country that will do, do with a vaginal breech at home. So I was like, I had all my bases covered if yeah, she was breech. Got it. Right. And then I had a midwife, but he was going away for Thanksgiving and he 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 prefaced that before we signed up with him. This is the only holiday I take all year and I will be taking it. So if she comes during that time, you'll be in the hands of your midwife. And I was like, cool. But then she turned. Mm -hmm. She turned and I was like, shit, what do we do now? Because without him, like the midwife can't deliver a vaginal breach. It's it's C-section. Yep. And I was so freaked out about that. That was like, that was my one thing. Like in my one thing, like if you if if you had said, what's your worst case scenario, for me, would have been C-section. 
Mm. Right. I had no idea that she could have died. Like that wasn't even right on my radar, not right. even in the no. realm of the scope of possibility. But everything was checking out like the whole pregnancy was Fine. normal yeah and every all the sun you know every checkup yeah. everything was totally yeah and there were some complications with the insertion of the cord like um, um and and this is sort of we didn't everyone was like well how did she die what what right. happened so we didn't know until she was actually born she came out and her cord was not attached to the placenta mm -hmm. oh so wow. at some point over the course of 24 to 48 out uh, 24 hours her cord came to came uh, something happened whether she pulled on it or whatever so so we we delivered her and I'm in this whole moment with her and then obviously you then have to give birth to the placenta but it wasn't coming out so the doctor actually actually reach inside mm -hmm. and take it out mm -hmm. and then when he took it out and he looked at it and he inspected the placenta and then he inspected the cord he realized that she had something called a velamentous cord insertion. And it's like very super rare. But I would say without getting too technical, the easiest way to describe it is if you've have you ever seen a tree where it's it's got the trunk and then but the roots are above the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. They're not inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what a velamentous cord insertion looks like. So mm -hmm. all those roots that are supposed to be protected underneath the ground are now exposed and very vulnerable. So we didn't know that when we embarked on the process of doing what's called, I think it's called a version or an where they turn the baby. Mm -hmm. mm. So we we were a couple of weeks out from my due date and so we sat with our team and we're like, well, what do we do here? You're going out of town. If, she if she's coming while you're out of town, we're kind of screwed. Right, because it'd be a C-section. Yeah, yeah, so they were like, th that was sort of talked about, but it was more like off the table. It was more like, okay, there's acupuncture, there's all the, there's certain yoga positions you can do to turn her, and there's this amazing practitioner in LA that you could see. He's wonderful. He's a doula. He's been in the birth field for many, many years, and he's very skilled at, at turning babies. So I was like, okay, well, I'll meet with him and let's see what this is about. So he said, there's no forcing. We do it over the course of maybe six to eight sessions. You lay on a table. We just sort of massage all the myofascial tissue around your hips and your back. And and then we um, tilt the table like this so, so that the baby sort of moves down. Mm -hmm. And if if she moves down and she's sort of in a position where we can sort of put our hands on her and move her a little bit well we just they just sort of feel the first session was just sort of feeling where she was and how she felt inside and she 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 didn't move we didn't like he sort of put his hands on either side and he's like no she doesn't want to she doesn't feel like she wants to move and so you know the table goes back I go away I come back a couple of days later we try again no okay came back table no and then I kept thinking like on the third session, like I, I wonder why she's not moving. And I, I rang my mom and my mom was like, well, I mean, I don't know, Libby. She said sometimes the baby will turn the day before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but, I, I'm, you know, and I'm panicking because I'm like, you know, what am I going to do? And had I had like another person in my field of influence that could have said to me, sat me down and been like, you know, I, I know you have this beautiful vision. Mm -hmm. I know you want to have her at home. I know you're fully sold on the fact that not having any drugs, you know, is going to be healthier for her. I get all that. But what's the ultimate goal here? Right. What's the ultimate goal? Well, it's to have a healthy baby, to deliver a healthy baby. Okay. So what are you know there are some other options available to you like it's like a really sober conversation but the team that I picked <clears throat> they're amazing at what they do but that's not their scope like right. yeah. yeah so it was not they're gonna help you do it this way yeah yeah and I think c-section was brought up but I was just like well okay okay that will be my last resort right we'll try this and then that will be my last resort so on the sixth session she actually turned we did the massage, blah, 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 turned around, and she, like, flipped really easily. There was no 
pushing or forcing or anything. It was just very like, yeah, she turned. And then we did a couple of follow-up ultrasounds and she was doing fine, like really well, strong heartbeat. And she was six pounds, two ounces. She, 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 she wow. was not a big baby. No, but, but that's, that's, yeah, 21 I mean, inches Shepherd was long. only four. Right. Really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Little yeah. teeny weeny. Yeah, six is, I mean. No, that's six. A, my daughter was 6'11". Wow. Yeah, 6'9". Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so she's yeah, she she was was a full. So she, yeah, she's she was a full, fully, mm-hmm. fully, fully. Mm-hmm. You, so she turned and then, you know, we did ultrasounds leading up and then something happened that night when I was downstairs on the computer. Like that was sort of. You could feel it, you mean? I couldn't feel something going on because I was like. Right. So in my busyness, but at one point I um, saw this like, this is going to sound so strange, but I saw this like flash of light out of the corner of my eye, like a yellow gold mm-hmm. kind of light, like if someone f- turned a yeah. light on and I, and I just sort of turned my head and then I didn't see anything and I just sort of went back and closed my computer and went upstairs. But in hindsight, I feel like that was probably when she left mm. and I went and laid in bed and I, and you know, the, the the midwife was like, well, when when did she move last? Mm. And I was like, fuck, I don't remember. I don't remember when I felt her move last. But there was something around like, so did did turning her, you know, did that, yeah. is it, was that the cause of her death? No. But did it compromise her? It's like, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. fucking lutely Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. With a velamentous insertion, turning a baby, not a good idea. I'm sorry. Like, that's I don't a, care. That's okay. You don't like, need to be sorry. Like, where you stand on the spectrum. Like, I had a girlfriend call me, oh, gosh, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago. She was in the same position, baby to turn breech. She wanted to have a home birth. And I was that sobering conversation. Yeah. Wow. That sobering conversation I wanted to have, I got to give that to her. Yeah. And I was like, honey, I know what you want and I know your philosophy of life and I know <sighs> that this is the path you've chosen. And guess what? Your baby's chosen something else. Yeah. Right. They have different plans. Life on life's terms. Hey, what if this is what he wants? Because like, when I said to mom, why isn't she turning? She said, well, maybe she's comfortable there. Yeah. Maybe that's where she wants to be. And so this is another thing like that I think is so vital in this conversation with mothering. Like pick your lane, but be open to the middle path. Be open to the pivot. Everywhere, not just in mothering. Everywhere. In every yeah. Yeah. way, shape, and form. It's have, one of the yeah. biggest things I talk about with mm. pregnancy and, and having babies. And I've had miscarriages, so mm. I've had losses never carried, mm. you know. They were early on. But yeah. um, with birth, I even remember going into it being like, I'm open to whatever, mm. like whatever it is. Like, sure. Do I want an epidural? No, I'd love to try without it. If I need it, will I take it? Fuck yes, I will. Wow. If, you know, will I, I always knew I was going to go to the hospital because I was like, you know, mm-hmm. I'll just, whatever. It just feels safer for me. Safety, yeah. But I was open to anything. I'm like, if it has to be this, this or this. So that's like a conversation I always have. It's like, you don't mm. like relinquishing control, which you have to do a lot, mm. you know, with kids and everything else. But um, really doing that in the plans because what plans can you make when it's really not up to you? Mm. Right. And there's nothing more out of control than having a child inside of you. <laughs> no. Mm. Oh my God. Think. <laughs> yeah. Or outside, I'm sure. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or outside, but at least you can pretend you have a little bit more control over that. Right. Because you'd be like, you're not allowed to have that candy. <laughs> yeah. But like when that's happening, it's like, there's yeah. so much going on that is outside of your control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, oh, definitely. And yeah. I will say this, like Libby is one of the strongest human beings I've ever come across in I mean, my I, life. I see that. Like literal <clears throat> hero. Like that's why everyone in your life worships you. Well, it's true. She could have a cult because we're all obsessed <laughs> with it. She could. <laughs> She could. I Love believe you. it. She could. The beauty calls. I believe it. <laughs> she could. But no, but yeah, like everything. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and 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 not to change the conversation from yeah. what happened to, to then, yeah. but she went through this, gave birth to Magnolia, that grieving process, <gasps> what she went through, and then continued to have 
Um, yeah, man, yeah, I had three more miscarriages after her. I did my <gasps> How mom. How far along were the miscarriages? Uh, the first two were ten and then the last one was, I think, eight or six. And then um, a year after Magnolia passed, so it's just a circle back, so it was a velamentous insertion. Right. Nope. Nobody it wasn't detected yeah. in any of the ultrasounds, very mysterious. And to me, you know, like we didn't know, we didn't see it. It was we weren't meant to. Right. We weren't meant to. Right. Like the level of healing <sighs> that has come through this loss and the teachings that have come through this loss and the poetry that's come through this loss and the writing that's come through this loss. I mean, I've literally wrote my way through my healing. Mm. And and now I'm on a mission to help other mothers and parents process their grief, you know, again, yeah. to go back to the beauty thing that we started with, to take something so terrifying and so devastating and to alchemize that experience into something that's beautiful that you can learn to walk alongside. Yeah. You know, you don't have to love what happened in order to accept it. I don't That's have right. to like it. No. I don't have to agree with it mm -mm. in order to come into acceptance of it. But, you know, we, my husband and I had the most beautiful baby and she was so gorgeous and just so precious. And, but, you know, she just wasn't meant to stay. And I think part of her mission, part of her purpose was to crack us open as individuals and as a couple to bring us into a deeper level of understanding of spirit mm -hmm. and the eternal nature of life, the magic of life, the miracle of life, the, the miracle that it is that we even exist, yeah. that we are even here, that we get to have this conversation, that we get to have kids at all. The fact that I got to carry her for 39 weeks in my body, like <sighs> that was a gift. Mm. Yeah. To feel that love oh. between me and her, to sing to her in the shower, to like, like it was just a beautiful gift. And it, and it's like, who's to say? Like, how do we quantify the value of a life? Right. Right? Oh, it shouldn't have happened. Oh, really? Really? How do you know that? Right. Because, well, that goes to the USM right? teachings because of I curriculum. Don't, right. I don't know. And right. therefore, like, Oh, it shouldn't have happened. Oh, oh, she didn't get to live. And she, you know, it's like, well, maybe she wasn't meant to. Right. You know, like I, if I get to choose what I hold on to, the framework of how I hold this experience and the framework with which I hold this experience is going to shape my, my interaction and experience of it, then I'm going to choose into what feels good to me. And what feels good to me is knowing that, we didn't know about the cord insertion. We didn't know that turning her with a cord insertion like that would compromise her. We didn't have any idea. We did the best we could. We made the choices that we did. We picked the team that we picked. Everyone was super qualified. It's like, and, and this happened. And this is life. Right. This is life. There's this is life. Such massive lessons in your whole whole experience that mm. I'm like mind blown by all of it you know like the lessons in like what you're talking about like mm. you didn't know a compromiser but yeah potentially it did and like yeah. living with that and processing that but where you are now having yeah. been through all that like mm -hmm. all of these lessons that you've taken and it's turned into a positive spin to yeah. help others to talk yeah. about it to heal yourself mm -hmm. it's so massive mm -hmm. and the strength that comes from you because of this whole experience it's electric like you can mm. feel it and it is the, I don't think there's anything harder, you know, in life than losing a child yeah. and going through that. But to do what you've done with it is yeah. beautiful. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's, to remain a mother. Like, I, I really yeah. feel that you're birthing Magnolia mm -hmm. in this book, you know? Yes. And, like, that, you know, one of the things they taught us really early on at USM is that our soul chooses it's curriculum, mm -hmm. right? And if you can buy into that for a moment, she chose you for a reason, mm -hmm. a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. And there is so much healing that you have to offer and so much strength of heart and wisdom and grace and poetry and beauty <sighs> that, yes, she's not here, yeah, but she's here. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you know that. Yeah. And you are one of the most incredible mothers I've ever come across. And in a second, I want you to read us some of your poetry. Mm. But like, one of the things that happened not that long ago when Shepard was in the hospital with COVID, you know what I needed and I was craving? Mm. And Libby wrote me and she said, what do you need from me? And I said, I need a weekly call with you. Mm. I need you. Mm. And she would show up on that weekly call Mm. and pray with me Mm -hmm. and be there for me and mother me Mm. with what I was going through with my child. And every day she'd say, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. And what do you need Mm -hmm. at the scariest time of my life? Mm -hmm. You mothered and you continue to mother. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep on mothering. (laughs) Oh my God. You know what I have? And I have on my motherfucker socks. (laughs) 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 I mean... Not even intentionally. Would you just like flip, yeah, just think, flip to somewhere? So, and because yeah, Rachel's it. never heard your poetry, no. so so it was amazing. <laughs> the night we got home from the hospital, that night it was like two in the morning, and I I like couldn't sleep. I don't know if it's because I still had the drugs in my body, the pitocin or whatever. I was like, but I just I kept hearing these words in my mind, and they wouldn't go away. They just kept circulating over and over and over again, over and over and over again. And finally, I was like, I just. Uh, if I write these down, maybe maybe they'll stop and I can go back to sleep. So I got up in the dark, made my way over to my husband's desk, got some paper and a pen, and I went and sat on the bathroom floor and I just turned the light on in the toilet and I just sat there and I just wrote down everything that I was hearing. And then I turned the light off and I went back to bed and I woke up the next morning and I read it out loud and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I read it to him and he was like, whoa. <laughs> And then, and then that just something opened up. And that day, like two more started downloading, just like, and sometimes it was her voice. Yeah. Mm. It was so surreal. My husband feels her energetically. Like he has a, every day he meditates, um, so an hour and 15 minutes every day, no exceptions. Wow. An hour and Amazing. 15 minutes. No you need to meet Scooter. Exceptions. Amazing. Next no level. exceptions. He will wake up, he checks his phone to make sure there are no emergencies, he turns it off, he goes back into bed, and now in 15 minutes, no exception, sometimes an hour and a half every single day. Wow. And it's in that, in his meditation, in his heart, where he calls to her and he calls to her to feel her and says, come come be with me, come be with me in my heart. And so his relationship with her now is very, like, metaphysical, it's very energetic. Yeah. And I said, what happens when you call her into your heart? He says, it's like, uh, it's just mm-hmm. like this. If it had a sound, it was like, it was just this feeling of like a, a surge of energy. And I'll ask her questions, yes, no questions. And I'll sometimes, and he'll get a surge of energy if it's a yes. And he gets nothing if it's a no. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow. So he connects with her that way. I can sort of, I hear her, like when I'm really quiet, I can hear her or on Mother's Day, I'll write to her. I'll just take a pad of paper and I'll write to her and and just ask, you know, inwardly, like, is there anything you want to share with me? I do this with my own mum too Um, because a year after Magnolia died, my mum got a brain tumour. She got glioblastoma. It's just like one of the most severe diabolical forms of brain cancer and almost guaranteed, like, I've heard one doctor call, G, it's called glioblastoma multiform, so GBM, and one doctor said, oh, yeah, we used to we used to not joke, but we used to talk about glioblastoma in medical school as meaning goodbye, motherfucker, <sighs> because it just, it's just, it's very hard to recover you're from. You're, yeah. go- you're gone, you know. So so mum got glioblastoma. Um, and One year later. One year later. And then we did 18 months of treatment and then she passed away. And then a year later, my husband's mom passed away. And within six weeks, his dad, completely living on the other side, of, other side of the country, he passed away too. So in the scope of oh five God. years, Fuck. we lost our daughter, both our mothers and his father. And it was just one initiation after the next 
like these death initiations. And it's like the thing that the death has taught us really it's because to distill it down is, is really how to live, how to live with mm. gratitude and how to live with an open heart and how to be discerning about like, what am I doing with my time? Yeah. Who am I investing in? Mm. If there's no circuitry in that relationship, mm. gone, got yeah. to go. No, thank you. No, no anger, no animosity. Don't have time for it. No, nothing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I need some fucking circuitry here. <laughs> There's some like care bear energy going out. That just yeah. needs to come back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so this is sort of like my little care bear offering. It's a collection of poems. Um, I never set out to write a book. I, I really, this was, I set out to heal and writing was how I healed. And now I do these like little online immersions on with writing and teaching people how to transmute grief and whatever they're feeling through, you know, creative self-expression. Um, and we're doing a beautiful retreat this month for 20 women who've experienced pregnancy and infant loss, um, teaming up with a friend of mine, Nicole Trumpio, who has a really great um, company called Bump Suit. And so we're, you know, she was getting a lot of returns because she makes clothing, maternity clothing wear, and she noticed that there were a lot of returns coming in and the staff, she asked the staff what was going on and she's like, well, they would buy the clothes and then they had a miscarriage so they would send the clothes back. Mm. So through my experience, her walking through my experience with me and then just seeing all these returns coming back in and she's like, whoa, wait a minute, as a company we need to be doing more to support this wow. these wow. moms, so what Huge. can we do? So we sort of teamed up to sort of Beautiful. we're now in, in discussion of how every – Every October we can use this window of national pregnancy and infant loss to like maybe do events all around the country and just get women in a safe space where they can be nurtured and to talk and have these conversations and share about their babies and share about their children and their hopes and their dreams and their grief and and to like really move through that in a in a way that leaves them feeling at the end of the retreat like more alive and deeply connected to themselves and so I started sharing my poems as they were coming through with friends and finally someone was like, many people were like, you know, this is, this is not just for you. And I was like, yeah. what do you mean? What do you mean? Don't be stingy. What do you mean? And they're like, well, you know, the poems, like I know, I, I know they've been very healing for you, but like what about everybody else? Like don't you think like you could make a book or something and maybe share that for other parents? And so I was like, ah. Oh, yeah, that might be a good idea. But it just it kept coming from all different angles from all different people. So finally I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, maybe this is, maybe this is, not maybe, not maybe, sorry. There she mm. is. <laughs> not maybe. This is the medicine that she gave to me and my husband and this is the medicine that she's come to give to the rest of the world and I just happened to be the open vessel to receive the words. So in, in many ways, you know, for so long I was like, I can't let it go. It's not right. It's not perfect. It doesn't make, it, it, will people understand it? Are people going to think I'm a freak, like that I have a relationship where I write to my daughter and I channel my daughter and like I had all these reservations and the color's not right and the co like I had all this crap to just <laughs> me not wanting to share, right? But um. But finally I was like, like, this is her, right? This is, this is, she gets to live in the world now. Like yeah. I get yeah. to let go of being stingy and having her for myself, but yeah. like she gets to live in the world now through these words. So I had, and I had a friend say like, you know, you're holding onto this book because you think it's not perfect, but I think you know it's perfect just mm -hmm. as it is. Mm -hmm. And, and I think like if you hold on to this, she's not going to have the experience of really getting to live her mission right. through these words. So you you have a duty to your daughter to let this go. So um, so this is it. Like we, my friend designed this beautiful it's cover. Absolutely oh. gorgeous. Um, and I love the cover because it's, um, it's like this image of a shadow, which I thought was a really beautiful choice for him. And it sort of ties into the quote on the back, which says, in the shadow of the deepest pain I've ever known lies more love than I ever knew possible. Mm. In the shadow of the deepest pain I've ever known lies more love than I ever knew possible. And I, I just, I couldn't fathom at the time that I could feel the way I feel today mm. and that I could, could still have a connection with my daughter and yet be sort of raising her 
in a different way, Mm -hmm. like just Mm -hmm. keeping that relationship, you know, present in my life. We celebrate all her birthdays and on her first birthday we planted a big magnolia tree in the front yard and we every year we build an altar with roses and flowers and incense and we sit under the tree and her first birthday fell on Thanksgiving Day. How's wow. about that? How's about How's it? How's about that? Thanksgiving wow. Day. She's this her first birthday. So we had all our friends come over and we wrote what we were grateful for and we just hung them in the tree like Aww. hundreds of little prayers. Everyone just wrote a handful of things they were, were they were thankful for. But I'm very thankful for all the people that have helped me sort of bring this book into fruition and I'm so excited to share it um, with you guys. But it's poetry, so it takes yeah. about an hour to read cover to cover, but I thought I could just sort of like open it up. And yeah, maybe just we'll open see it up. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is titled This Holy Labor. We give birth day and night, night and day. Each thought and feeling our silent becoming. Are we even conscious of all the ways we nourish or diminish this holy labor? God in these hands, I felt you there in her silence. I saw the miracle, even in her stillness. No book could describe, no way to this knowing. God in these hands. That's what I felt when I was holding her. It was like the holiest experience mm-hmm. of like the stillness, the peace, the quiet. Everything I'd been searching for was there right in my hands. You know? and mm. It just felt like we, we, we have no idea like how amazing we are. We have no idea how special we are. I think we forget time and time again. Like we wake up and we move into our routine and we forget like what a miracle it is to be alive. And it wasn't, it took holding her, Mm -hmm. holding death in my hands for me to realize like I wasn't living. Yeah. And so that was sort of the, that's, I think that's death's invitation really. It's like, yeah. Like to take a, an, an, an assessment what is it when you get sober where you take an assessment of your life? Inventory. An inventory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, motherhood. Against my naked chest, I held her lifeless body. I dissolved into nothing. The light I couldn't find in someone else's dogma, I saw in her beautiful face. Mm. Her death is a holy tapestry stitched into this body. <sighs> mm. This is not a tragedy. All day I peer through the windows watching you. All afternoon I am the wind by your side. These whispered words. Don't try to control your tears. Let them come. Mm. Looking for answers only leads to more questions. Let the words come. What if you can hear me? Then what? Don't let your mind tell you otherwise. You know what you know. This is not a tragedy. A tragedy is letting this consume your life. A tragedy is getting to the end, never having recovered. A tragedy are all the days lost in your searching. Remember, remember how the grief shattered you, uncovered the love you had hidden from yourself. Remember, remember, remember how grateful you were. You kept saying it, over and over 
and over again, you felt the significance of what was happening, even though you didn't like it. (laughs) You found beauty. You found beauty in that dark place. You found a freedom you'd never known. You found love. You found love. This is not a tragedy. (laughs) This is Libby. (laughs) (laughs) But it just, it just comes. Oh my God. It just comes. And she, beautiful. She comes. She comes to me. You know, it's, um, this one's really lovely too. It's called The Revelation. What say you of this grief? Holy. What say you of this rage? Holy. Mm. What say you of this death? Holy. What say you of this disaster, this inability to stand, this devouring fire, the hopelessness that scratches at my insides? Holy. 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 <sighs> holy. Holy. Yeah. Holy. 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 Shit. Holy. <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. But it is that, Libby. It, it's like the, there was one moment in my life, one moment mm. in my life where I felt a warmth inside of my body that is unexplainable. Mm. And that was when my dad died. Mm. And there was a warmth and a peace that took over me. That's what I'm talking about. That felt, I remember my blood, like my tears were coming out and it almost felt like warm blood. Like there was a, like I got this like warmth Mm. that took me over and for the first time in my life I felt peace Mm. and it was and I never felt it again right Mm -hmm. but the only time I've ever felt that even holding the babies Mm -hmm. no of -hmm. course the the tremendous amount of love and all of that but that feeling yeah to me I call it God Mm -hmm. universe Mm -hmm. spirit whatever Mm -hmm. it is in that moment, I knew there was something else. And you can't take that away from someone once they've felt that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, there is something incredibly beautiful in that. Yeah. And I do believe, like I do in my heart and soul, mm. that we choose these things for a reason. I don't know what they are. And I don't want to ask the questions because it brings more questions. Mm, but to evolve, maybe to, to, to evolve, to understand, to have more greater compassion. And But it makes know. me, you know, hearing you say this, like for today, I went, oh yeah, I want to be alive today. Right. Mm. I want to be alive today. And that's why these things are so healing because it's not just for parents that Mm -hmm. have lost a child. Mm -hmm. It's for all of us that go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, we all go to sleep in different times in our life and go through pain and go through sorrow and go through grief. None of us get out of it alive, right? And it's a wake-up call to what matters, And the more we can wake up to that every day, the greater sense of purpose we have and the more alive we are. Mm -hmm. Because it is a gift. And we don't know when it's going to go. And we don't know. Yeah, we all assume we're going to live to like we're 90 or whatever. (laughs) We We don't don't know know. shit. We don't know nothing. We We know know nothing. nothing. And we're pissing away these precious moments. You know what I mean? You have those moments where you're like catch yourself like, Five hours have gone by and you're like, what just happened? When did that time go? <laughs> five years. Like, five years. Five years. Yeah. yeah. What am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? Why are we waiting? Yeah. And what? even when you said like you questioned like, oh, is it going to sound, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, God, we all do that. Even yeah. with these tremendous <laughs> gifts inside that you have to offer the world that could right. help heal <laughs> tons of women mm. not feel so alone the mind comes in and is like mm, 
Yeah. Right. Keep oh, it in your mind. fucking journal. <laughs> like keep it to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say I had a beautiful therapist that I was working with and she would always tell me like, you keep putting yourself back in the ring mm. and that is living life. Right. Like mm. no matter what the outcome, she's like, you can survive anything mm. as long as you keep putting yourself back in the ring Mm. and every time and so every time I'm going through something I remember that and I'm like fuck this hurts but you know what I went for it Mm. again Mm. I keep showing up in my life again because Mm. otherwise like you said it's just going to pass by and then you Mm. look back and then and that's a tragedy that's that's a tragedy tragedy. (laughs) that's the tragedy right that's the tragedy yeah exactly but what a gift that you now that she's given you, mm-hmm. that the experience has given you, what's come through you. Yeah. Now you're putting it out there. And mm-hmm. like you said in the beginning, how it's something that people, you know, it's uncomfortable to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's awkward. But what is bigger to have gone through than that? Yeah. And like to feel alone in that or the grief you feel in that, but to feel like if there is a community or other people that can relate or you can share or you can help heal, I think these are the most important things to talk about. Yeah. And what do we miss out on when we don't have these conversations? What do we miss out on? Don't you think it's weird that we spend so much time preparing to give birth? Like we read all these books, we watch all these videos, we have all these doctor's appointments, we go to meditation, we learn about hypnosis, some people, you know, like we do all this preparation for bringing life into the world. But like how much preparation do we do on the other side? Like the other bookend of this experience called our life is death. Right. And we spend all this time preparing for birth. And yet on the flip side, probably the second most powerful, if not the most powerful experience of our lives, the second most powerful, I don't know, is our death. Right. Mm. Is our death. We don't, we just avoid it, avoid uh, it, avoid uh, it, avoid uh, it, <laughs> avoid it, right? Right. But like there are so many amazing books and Tibetan mm-hmm. texts and like yeah. there's, there's a way I think in which if we could open ourselves more to understanding the inevitability of the dissolution yeah. of this physical experience, it's coming for all of us. Right. Like, yeah. like how to meet that moment. Like I want to meet that moment with so much presence and consciousness mm. that's available to me and softness and like, and I think, like, just even watching my mom in preparation and edging towards to meeting that moment, there was a part of her that was, like, so, like, oh, it's even in here. She said to me, this is in, in the epilogue, I had this conversation with my mom. It was so powerful. She said she wasn't afraid of dying. And I'm like, what do mm-hmm. you mean? <laughs> She's like, and she said, well, in my meditation, like, um, she had this experience in her meditations and I was like, well, tell me more about that. What do you mean? The most memorable talk I had with my mom during her sickness was about dying. I remember sitting in her room in, a, in palliative care one day and out of the blue she said to me, I want you to know, honey, that I'm not afraid of dying. She continued saying that in her meditations she was becoming aware of herself as pure energy, <laughs> an infinite energy not bound by this body. She described this energy as a warm, golden light. Mm. And she said it felt wonderful. She said that she was unafraid because she was starting to realize this energy was who she really was. And this energy, quote, never ends. Mm. She said, I'm not afraid to die because I'm just opening and closing the door. And when I asked her to tell me more about that, she said, death is like opening a door and walking through to the other side. When I close my eyes, when I close that door, I will no longer be Joan. I will no longer be who I think I am, but I will remember who I have always been, this energy that is everywhere and everything. In the years that have unfolded since Magnolia and my mother's death, I've come to realize that I can choose to live each day in gratitude for the time I got to share with them, or I can dismantle my life and let everything I love fall to the wayside because mm. of what happened to them. Mm. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's the choice point, 
right? That's the choice point. Mm -hmm. This is a tragedy or this is an experience that's really fucking gnarly and harsh and the hardest thing I've ever been through in my whole life and maybe there's something in this for me. Maybe there's an opportunity here for me. You know, maybe there's a gift hidden in this devastation, you know, because <laughs> like, like, yeah, if anyone was going to sign up for it, it would be her. I can just see all the souls and she'll be like, oh, do it. <laughs> like, I literally see Libby being like, I'll do it. I can do this. I'll be the mom. Yeah. yeah. You be the daughter. I'll be the mom. Yeah. You know, we'll write this, this writing that's going to help. Heal. But like, that's an enriched yeah. life. That's a life looking for purpose and looking for every opportunity to make something out of it versus every opportunity to be completely broken because, mm -hmm. and I don't know, you're the one on the other end of it saying that there is a choice. And I don't think a lot of people know that there's a choice in that Yeah, mm -hmm. because I think it's so blinding that they may not feel that there's an opportunity to have a choice in that. Yeah, I get it. I was definitely in that place. I mean, it's been, it will be nine years this November. She would have wow. turned nine this year. It's the same year. exact age as my daughter. Wow. Yeah. And I just look at little girls now and I'm like, oh my God, what would she, what would her voice sound like? And yeah. what would yeah. her hair, like what would it feel like to run my fingers to it and like to like dress her and buy her things? And so we're getting ready to do a beautiful book launch Um when are you doing it? So we're doing it, um, we're doing like a small gathering yeah. for like the people who are really sort of there in the beginning for us. I sent the invite out last night. You should be getting it. You should have it in your inbox. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> uh, but um, yeah, we're doing it on this beautiful rooftop in this amazing healing oasis. Oh, you told me about that. Yeah. In, in the, like overlooking the Hollywood Hills. It's like at sunset with like lights and candles and like Moroccan style rugs. And like, I'll read from the book and I have a friend that's going to come and sing some songs. And amazing. we're basically going to, um, just bless the book. We're going to make an altar and pile the books and some crystals and flowers. And, um, it'll be the new moon, which is sort of like a nice portal to sort mm -hmm. of send intentions out. So we're, we're just going to gather people to light a candle, um, to honor someone they've lost. Um, and then also just to sort of put some good energy into the book before we send it out into the world. And I decided to self-publish because the whole route of like looking for an agent, looking for a yeah. pub. I was just like, no, I got to get these out now. I got to, it doesn't have to be yeah. perfect. It doesn't have to be a traditional like rollout. But so we've made this book. I found a really great company um, mm -hmm. and coincidentally it's called Book Baby. Oh, <laughs> so I was looking at different vendors and I was like, oh, Book Baby, yeah. that's kind of cute. So I'm, I'm rolling it out through them and it'll be available um, on on their platform. It will be available on Amazon, but I really want to channel everyone to Book Baby because we yeah. are donating 100% of the proceeds of this book um, to Every Mother Counts. It was an organization oh. that was created yeah, by yeah. Christy Turlington. Yes. Yeah. And so when we're looking for an organization to donate to, there are a lot within America, but I was like, no, this needs to be global. We need to find somebody who's on the ground, in the trenches, working with mothers in remote villages, like Everywhere. everywhere, like yeah. every mother mm -hmm. yeah. counts, every baby counts, every you know. So, so we're donating one hundred percent of the proceeds to them. So amazing! If people buy the book through Book Baby, fifty, I get fifty percent. Oh no, I get more than fifty percent. I get a lot of royalties, which then I can send on to these guys that are doing such great work. And I, I think that's what that's what Mike Nolia would want. Yeah. We're so grateful that you came today and, yeah. mm. and shared so openly. And beautifully. What's so easy with you two? <laughs> I was just saying, like, like it's like, mm, we're going to have fun, but then we're going to talk about some really heavy we're shit. We're going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll cry. have more fun later. Yeah. Like, we'll yes. do this again. Yeah. And, and we'll have more fun. Oh, you know what would be amazing would be to have uh, Steve come on. I was oh thinking that. I was like, you need to talk to him. Yeah, you yeah. said that. He's yeah. amazing. I mean, everyone he's calls incredible. Him, everyone calls him Scooter. That's yeah. his like nickname. Yeah. But like when we started dating, I was like, I can't call you Scooter anymore. That's so weird. Because <laughs> like that's like when I was his friend, I was like, yeah, Scooter's my friend. You yeah, know, like, <laughs> cool. we're friends. And then when we were dating, I'm like, it's not, it's not sexy to call you Scooter. He's you know, so like, cool. Scooter. It's like insane. <laughs> yeah. Can yeah. you make out with like like that's so weird. So, <laughs> Let's do so, it. Let's Steve. do a little writing um 
evening at Libby's. That'd Let's be fun. do a little like writing routine. Yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. And you know, it's it's amazing because see, in this realm of um this conversation around pregnancy loss. Every book that I've come across so far, every single one, is all written from the perspective of the mother. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole other part of the equation right. that gets left out. How it affects And often, that, yeah. like, during the grieving, everyone would be like, how is she doing? How right. Is she, how, about, is she? how are you? Is, how, how is she? And he's right. sort of like, um, yeah, she's, she's, she's okay. She's doing okay. And then it's just sort of like. You know, yeah. what about what about you? Me? Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, like uh, I had finished the book. We had put it, it was in its manuscript form and we were formatting it. And then I was cleaning his desk one day. Um, and I saw this like notepad and I saw our daughter's name several times in his handwriting. And I was like, honey, what is this? And he's like, Oh, that's some writing that that Angela had me do. And I was she's our therapist. And I was like, Well, what is it? And she said, Oh. That's my story. And I said, Aww. your story? And he said, yeah, she wanted to know what it was like for me to be in that room that night and to hold your mm-hmm. hand and to kneel yeah. down at the side of the bed and to, like, deal with my own pain along with my work. And and that's my story. And I said, can I read it? And he said, yeah. And it's, like, pages and pages and and he would loop back because it was like he would loop back into something that I felt like he was just trying to to digest. And it was so beautiful and so humbling. And it just like brought me to my knees to see that experience through his eyes. Yeah. And I said, could you please, would you please give me permission to put this in the book? And he said, well, but what do you mean? And I said, well, it's, it's so important for men to know that it's yeah. okay to be vulnerable. And this is the most vulnerable thing that I've ever read. And I think it could really help not just fathers feel not alone in their journey, but also the mothers and the the, the partners, you know, yeah. the, the partners, right? what the other partner is dealing with. And so it's in the book. It closes out. It's after the, the last poem and it's titled A Father's Thoughts. Mm-hmm. And it's very beautiful. So it's got my energy, his energy, her energy. It's like like a, a family offering. Yeah. 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 So we're thank you so much for oh my goodness. letting me dive in with you and have this conversation. Absolutely. I'm so grateful that you did. Mm-hmm. And we can't wait for everyone to read your beautiful poetry. And I now I really want to read his perspective because I think that's I'll leave that there for you. So oh, cool. yay. Absolutely. Really? Yeah, yay. Oh my God, amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna get over the fact that the the filter on the cover is not as colorful. <laughs> it's not as bright and vibrant as it should be. But I think it's, it's really the words. It's I love words. it. It's perfect. beautiful. Yeah, this one's a little brighter, but whatever. It's it's really it's funny, like as I was fiddling around with it, often Magnolia would come in and be like, it's like people, yeah. people are going to turn it and then, like, they're not going to look. <laughs> they don't even care. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful, it's Libby. Beautiful. As beautiful. are all of your beautiful and everything. offerings. Mm. Thank you so much. And there's some photos in there of her as well, of of me and him and her and my mom. Really? And yeah. There's a, very, there's a very powerful moment. Um, we were all waiting for Steve to hold her. Yeah. Because uh, it was, I, I was holding her and then I'd offered a few times and he said, no, I think, I think I'm. I think I'm going to wait. I think, you know, and it was just this moment of like everyone had held her except him. Mm -hmm. And he, the midwife said, come here. And she took him out into the hallway and she said, what's going on? And he said, I, I can't do it. I can't, I can't, I can't bring myself to do it. I, if I, if I hold her, I'm never going to be able to let her go. And if I hold her, I'm never going to, I will never, I, I think it's best if I just don't hold her. And she said, listen to me, I know you. You need to go in there and you need to hold your baby because if you don't, you are going to regret this for the the rest rest of your life. life. Yeah. And he said, okay, okay, okay. So he's like, so what do I do? Like, do I put her on my skin? And she said, yeah. So he unbuttoned his shirt and he opened his shirt and then he like held her on his body. And so there's a, there's a picture of him just sort of like holding her all bundled up in there. And it's just a very powerful moment yeah but it's yeah it's um it's a it's a never-ending love story really it's like well what is your book about it's kind of like a it's a love story Mm -hmm. 
it's like, what do you mean a love story? It's like, well, the it's the love that created her, right? That was so unreal. What was it like when you held your baby for the first time, like looking at, like, c- right? Because it's like your love and his love came together. Like you created that child is born out of the deepest expression of your love and holding that manifestation of your love in physical form in your hands is just like so mind-blowing, right? But, like, it is a love story. It's a story of love, love coming into being and love leaving and then the love that was left behind, the love that continues on. Like, it never ends. It just Mm-mm. never ends and there's nothing in this world that could, can stop this love, Mm-mm. the love yeah. you feel for your father, the love I feel for my mother, like the love that we share yeah. for, for, for one another. And, and I think the biggest invitation in this experience, in any experience in our lives when we're challenged, is to go inside and really love ourselves. Like that's it. I think that's one of the biggest yeah. life lessons I've sure. been working on is like loving yourself, but not just loving yourself when things are good, but like loving mm-hmm. the grief, loving the anger, loving the rage. Like, well, I don't want to love that. I don't want to love that part of myself, but it's like that's not love then. Right. That's right. conditional. Can yeah. yeah. Like for sure, love is saying yes to to it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just get showing up in that ring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you okay? Yeah, love showing up in that ring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's it. I really appreciate the simplicity of that mm-hmm. image because you're either in the ring or you're out of yeah. it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was something so simple, and she said it to me so many times, and I was like, "Fuck, I'm in that ring a lot." <laughs> uh, the ring but, of fire. Yeah, <laughs> that, that too, that too. Yeah, that's so well, true. Well, this has been amazing. Amazing. It's been incredible. Yeah. And um, I'm going to go online and order my copy. We'll leave that one with Rachel. <laughs> yeah. <absolutely. laughs> well, I'm still ordering one, supporting mm. from Book Baby. For yeah, because sure. the yeah. proceeds go. So yes, that absolutely. makes sense anyways. Yeah. Yeah. But thank yeah. you so much, Libby. I love you, you for Libby. having me. I love you I too. Love you so I love the work you're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, okay, guys, yeah. I don't really know how we follow that conversation in our usual way because we definitely talk about silly stuff, light stuff, but maybe that's okay too. Um, it's just, it was such an impactful conversation Yeah, that I don't really know where we go from here. Well, I will tell you this, if it makes any difference to you. One of the things I love most about Libby is while she's deep, poetic, all of those amazing things, She's also funny as fuck <laughs> and can find the beats and the humor in life when things get dark and tough. And so Beautifully in put. honor of that. Yeah. Let's get silly. Hi, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Enter Rob. <laughs> Enter Rob. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, how's everyone's week been? Ooh, Olivia, that's a heavy mm. week. Yeah, she got some stuff. She got some stuff. I have a lot of physical anxiety this week. I had a lot From of anxiety what? this week. I think well, you always do. So let's unpack hers okay. first. Sure. Question: Do you ever get anxiety? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the calmest kidding. anxiety I've ever yeah. seen. About yeah, yeah. It's the most casual anxiety, anxiety ever. Yeah. 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 Anxious right now. Yeah. And that's how fucking, it goes. fucking spinning right now. <laughs> So this week, my anxiety has been really heightened, physical anxiety, like having a hard time breathing, all of that stuff, right? And Jeff says, it's because you're worrying too much. And I'm like, I don't really- I'm sorry, say that word again? Worrying. Okay. How'd I say it? Worrying. You were like worrying. I don't know. You said it funny. Oh, did I say it funny? Okay, continue. Does that make you anxious when she corrects it? I can't breathe. I am the Ross. I correct everything. He said it's because you've been worrying too much this week. Hmm. I don't believe that it's attached to worrying. I think sometimes I get physical anxiety and it's not like there's thoughts that are provoking it. I would like to hear your guys' thoughts on that. You're saying it's not thought provoked? I don't feel like it's that I'm having these like thoughts that are giving me anxiety. I feel like the anxiety is just physically present 
I mean, hmm. I think it can, I think anxiety can be induced by like not sleeping enough, not getting enough physical mm-hmm. activity. Like I have days and times where I feel off and anxious or low and it's usually from that, not just that. Not just thoughts, right? Yeah. 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 See, I agree. What about you? A hundred percent. I'll wake up with anxiety for no reason when I haven't even had a thought. <laughs> you, when, <laughs> when's the last time you woke up without anxiety? I wake up without anxiety a lot of the time. Okay. Just checking. I just wanted to get like a baseline for everyone. Would you say I'm always like an anxious person? Honestly. You experience overwhelm a lot. <laughs> overwhelm? Mm-hmm. Mm. Hmm? Oh, yeah. you're always like I'm overwhelmed. Well, I am overwhelmed. That's what ex- that's what I mean <laughs> by experiencing overwhelm. Hmm. See, I wonder if collectively, because of what's going on in the world, whether I'm thinking about it or not, that it affects my energy and my motor. Hmm. We're looking to Rob yeah. when he's like, I, I've I got- believe you think that. <laughs> Do you think there's anything to that? Do you think there's things like collective energy? Because everybody I've talked to this week, I'm like, how are you? Really anxious. This week, I feel like everyone, same for me. It's like heavy, anxious something. Right. Not for Rob. (laughs) No, I mean, (laughs) it's because there's heavy stuff all over the news right now. Right. Everyone is, I don't think people, I think everyone is, aware of what's going on and that's making them anxious yeah i just what i what something that was brought up in a recent conversation was you know how open and communicative elliot's school is about all world matters and everything going on in the world no matter Mm -hmm. what it is and they're very open with the kids about it they're they're open are they opinionated are they or just just informative informative they're not opinionated. They have things where they're writing us daily letters and offering us support on how to talk to our children about it, how to Briar school does that, these things. Mm-hmm. And then the the kids are talking about it with each other, though. So mm-hmm. Elliot came home and he said to me, he said he had a really hard day. And I said, why? And he said a friend of mine was really sad because her culture is at war. And I said, okay, let's talk about that. So we sat down with him and we had a conversation of what that means and what's going on and what we can do as loving citizens to offer some sort of support for his friends that are going through really big feelings. But I will say, I realized that he got to it before we did. Mm. And that was something I was like, oh, wow. Like, it didn't occur to me that I should sit down and talk to him about this before he goes to school because they're going to be right talking about it. Right. Um, right. Have you guys had those conversations? Mm-mm. No. I mean, what? yeah, I guess at what age is that feel appropriate? I lean a little too heavy on, I don't. Protecting. Yeah. I'm more of the like they don't need to. I, I mean, I think it's also kid dependent. Like, it's my Breyer kid though. And Calvin are very, very sensitive. sensitive. Very so, sensitive. Where Elliot, like anything, like her cousin was telling her a story how a kid got chopsticks stuck in the roof of their mouth on the bus, and I'm like, she's never going to use chopsticks. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's just very sensitive. Is she going to use chopsticks? I don't know. She didn't at dinner the other night. She didn't. No, she did. Oh. You're like, oh no, wait, that's when she told her. (laughs) (laughs) But that's when they told her. So I don't know. We haven't tested it since then. I think she's fine. But that's just an example of like how she takes things in. She's such an empath and so sensitive. Well, you have to understand their emotional intelligence and what they can handle. But do you think it's also you like not presenting these things is keeping her that sensitive as opposed to like I wonder the more I question exposure, it yeah. like yeah you get chopsticks stuck up your nose I question it but then I'll do things just casually like yeah you know and explain it and then it's like I hear about it for the next few months and she's like really trying to understand it and like but having a really hard time and I don't yeah. know I don't know it's still a work in progress yeah I, I get it I think it's purely an age thing though because if like Calvin was 15 I would have no problem well yeah that'd have... be so weird well I know <laughs> and we talk to him like he's an adult most of the time but if we know things are gonna affect him well, differently 
Yeah. Then. But we didn't sit down and be like, hey, Elliot, let's get in ahead of this and talk to you about this. Yeah, yeah. He came home because of his peers. Yeah, I mean, school throws a wrench in everything. It throws a wrench in everything. Yeah. Like, it does. And I, you know, maybe you, she'll come home today with something that she learned at school and then you talk about it. That's kind of child-led. Right. Yeah. It's it's tricky, though. It, seems, it doesn't seem proactive enough for you, is what you're... I would have loved... You would have loved to have I would the conversation have loved first. to have the conversation first so that when his friend did come to him, he had a little bit of understanding of what was going on and not being completely like, what? Yeah, yeah. Caught you off know? guard. Yeah, he was caught off... for a few hours. He was caught off guard and he had a really rough couple days over it. Well, it's, like, you know, it some of these topics very are very complex and hard to process and understand, you know? For right. anyone, but also young minds, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I don't know. School, sometimes I'm like, do I just, do we just do Teresa Palmer style and like. No school. No, they go to school. But just, <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah. Home school. No, they go to school too, but it's just, it's a little more fluid, you know, and it's not, I don't know. It's, it's, you can't protect them from life. They're going to live their life. You can give them the tools. To try to navigate it, but that in itself is challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Tough man. Any Yule house. All right. Any Yule house. So today, um, I said something to Shepard because he was being like a little little brat. And I said, Hey, I made you. And then Elliot's like, Did you eat our embryos? And I was like, <laughs> What? <laughs> He's like, well, did you eat our embryos? Like, is that what happens? You eat the embryo and then you grow the baby and then you have the baby come out of you? And I... You said yes. I said every last <laughs> I didn't know what to say because I haven't had that conversation yet with him. About of, sex and how it happened? Yeah. Of like the actual, this mm -hmm, is what... It, mm -hmm. I know Jeff would. Jeff would be like, well... Calvin, yeah. yeah, Calvin has had the like clinical version of it. The penis goes in the vagina? Really? Interesting. Hmm. He was like four, I think, he asked. And we were like, yeah, this is it. Yeah. I'm wondering, I, mean, it, I think it, it's time for Elliot, to be honest. I think telling him at that time, though, it like didn't really mean much to him either. And it was right. just a very like scientific, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of baggage or weight behind it. Yeah. Which now he might have a little more. Hmm. You haven't told Briar. She doesn't really ask the questions often. Right. Except she asks for her mom. Some, yeah. <laughs> Wait, does don't think. No, she, <laughs> she does ask. Rachel, how babies are made? She does ask. I have this video of her at three years old getting so frustrated because I couldn't explain where, like, humans came from. I tried to, you know, scientific. But she mm -hmm. was three. And she gets very frustrated not having a grasp on it. It's a really <laughs> funny video. I want to yeah. see it. Calvin, well, I was, Calvin was reading, like, Yuval Harari's. Yeah. Kids book mm -hmm. on you evolution. got it for Briar. Yeah, you guys have both read it, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you mean your kids? Sapiens. Yeah. The real one. The not the real one. No, no you got the, the kids, kids version. version. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. read it to your children? Not yet, but Elliot's reading now, so he can read it. Should give him it. It's next to his bed. Then he'll know. Yeah. Calvin loved it. Yeah, I mean, he he has a scientific mind because he, he did say the other day he's like. He, <laughs> What did he, he was like, can you explain to me what is a vagina? <laughs> and I said, it's a vagina. It's where, you know, you, you know how you have a penis and the pee comes out and it's outside of your body. Ours is like inside and comes out. And he's like, but is it, does it, <laughs> he said, does it look like strawberry or dogs? He's like, does it look like her little, her little... <laughs> Her little butthole. <laughs> <laughs> he said that little fat little butthole that's. <laughs> <laughs> I died. I was like, I don't know what to say, kind of. I'm like, <laughs> that fat little butthole. It called it like a fat, fat little butthole. Yeah, because it's like she's got her butthole and then she's got this fat little Oh, the little like it's like a, it's a, like a little like a turkey's like a Yeah, it's like a, it's like a little <laughs> yeah. vagina and he's like that fat little butthole thing next to her butt, you know? 
<laughs> He's like, I think that- you need to also show him what a, or teach him what a butthole looks so like. So he was like, is that what it looks like? <laughs> and I, and and he was like, how many holes are there? And I was like, oh my God, there's a urethra. And then there's a hole where oh. the baby comes out. And he was just about to ask, can I see it? And I was like, <laughs> what do you do? Do I go like Google a diagram? Yeah. That's what you do, right? Yeah, you don't. Spr- oh my like- <laughs> God, Rachel. <laughs> Could you imagine? Do you think anyone's ever done that? No. I, I mean, I'm sure someone's done it. Ooh, but I don't yeah, know. Also, you don't just pull up like Pornhub either. No, you know? but also no, like you a have drawn, no, drawn yeah, like, yeah, a, know, like getting health an anatomy picture. And if we're ranking the wrong things to do, first is showing your own <laughs> vagina. Oh Second God. is <laughs> I'm in a different position because I have a girl. So <laughs> that's she different. Has the same thing, you know. But still, like, of course, that's different. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, can I see it? Is well, she asked little... about a penis before. Mm-hmm. Well, she's probably seen a penis. She sees like the yeah. penises are out. You know what I mean? Like a vagina is more mysterious. <laughs> where, like, you have to like, go, you'd have to like, you know, <laughs> go in there. What are you looking at? She's a getting giant's underneath vagina? to look up <laughs> inside. Well, if you think about doing. like a kid in the shower with you, like they don't know what your inside of a vagina yeah, looks like. You don't see it that's what i mean right. you see a penis i yeah. hope yeah. i mean if you can't see your penis she's the only female in a house full of like 10 yeah. men yeah there's <laughs> literally they're just all over the men and so he was like it's got to be like strawberries <laughs> 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 the fat little butthole. <laughs> oh, I have a good one. Someone wrote us. This what? really yeah. made me happy. And I was like, I got to share that with them. You know how we put the video of like, do you tell someone if they have food in their teeth? They have food in their teeth. Oh, this, yeah. This girl wrote in and said that her dad didn't have the, <laughs> didn't have the heart to tell some women at the airport that he wasn't a taxi driver. So he drove them all the way. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I was love like, him. That is next level. Uh-huh. He didn't want to tell them. No, so he just he gave them a ride home. Yeah. But was he there to pick up his own family members? I don't know. <laughs> I, want, I wonder if I could find it. It was so good. That's so funny. What, Rob? What do you have? Got a question. What? All right. How do I, a 36 year old male, end a relationship with a person, 32 female, who refuses to leave my house? Ooh. What? My girlfriend, 32, has been living with me. 36 at my house for a year and a half. I have a teenage daughter from my previous marriage mm. that stays with us half the time. Mm. My girlfriend is less mature than a typical 32 year old and lately has been openly confrontational with my daughter. Ah. This relationship is not working. I'm cl- I've am i clearly told her that we're done several times and several times she's refused to leave the house. Ooh, that's Stating now that she lives here as well, will not leave and several days later we make up. I hate the situation and would like to live on my own for a bit instead of a toxic relationship that I'm in. How do I end it? Change the locks. (laughs) Literally, change the locks. Change the locks? She's squatting, dude. Yeah, but they they make up, which means... But don't make up with her. Yeah, he needs to stop doing that. Yeah. Step one. But if she's refusing, I mean, that's weird. That's not okay. It's not okay. Unless she doesn't have anywhere to go, then you then say... Then he should say, hey, you know, he could help her out. Yeah. Offer support. Like, what do you need to figure this out? Yeah. I'll help you. You have 30 days. Sounds like she's not uh, accepting any of these. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. That's why I say change the locks. If she's not accepting it, then you change the locks. She has squatters right She's going to, like, force herself in at that point. Come home and... The daughter comes home. Like then she's she's going to get in. Then you move. You move. You sell your house and you yeah, move. Yeah, you move. That's practical. Yeah. Well, what else are you going to do? I you know. call the cops. They're going to be like, she has every right to be here if she lives here. There's squatters rights. In California. I don't know oh. if that applies. Right. I don't know where they are. That's a that's a interesting My thing biggest thing is that she's trying to say things to the daughter. Yeah. Yeah. When I read that, I was like, that's... You don't step over those boundaries, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, no. 
right? No. <laughs> right. What if she was like, I'm yeah, fine, I'm fine with, with it. it. I'm fine with it. Yeah. My man comes first. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I don't know. That's, no. Mm-mm. Hey, you got it. She's got to go. So what would you do? Um, I would probably, if I had the means to do so, just get a, an apartment, have it all set up, and be like, you have a place to stay. You're gifting this person an apartment? For, Damn. No, just for like an Airbnb, whatever. Not like a lease that you're on for a year. But fine, I get them a place to stay. You're going to put your credit card down on that? And you're going to be liable for any damages Rob, to this new why Airbnb? Be so... I'm just, I'm helping you uh, think these things okay, through. Okay, what? but just having an option and a solution might help him out if he has the means to do so is all I'm saying. And if he doesn't? <laughs> Buy her a house. <laughs> and if you don't have the means for that. No, I don't know. That's tough because if you're dealing with a person that's not accepting it, how would you get her Yeah, house? what would you do? I would change, I would change the locks. I, I mean, it's all those steps. It's like you... Try to have the conversation of, like, you need to leave. This is not okay. And then if that doesn't work, you bring in a mediator. And then if that doesn't work, when Change she leaves, you pack up some stuff. Yep, put it in storage. Change the locks. and Because, like, assuming, you know, this person has nowhere to go, you put their stuff in storage. That's what I would do. You get some nice bins and put them on your front yard. Yeah, but then what if people take them? Have you ever gotten so mad at someone that they, you put their stuff out on the front yard like they do in the movies? No. Oh. Have you? I have. Have you? No. No? Care to uh, elaborate? I, I was young and I got really upset and I put... You were living with this person? Yeah. Fully? Both on the lease? No lease. Young. I mean, they were living with me. It was your lease, though, your apartment. They were yeah, squatting. Yeah, my house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were living with me, and then they upset me. And what? Can we talk about what upset you? They did. They were partying and didn't come home. And I was, like, staying up. They missed curfew? And they missed you, curfew. And you threw <laughs> their belongings? Was it the first time? Was this, like, no, the third time No, it was time multiple it times. He would like to stay out really late and party and be like, I'll be home in an hour, and then... Hours would go by. I would be watching the news to see if he like got in a car accident and died because I'd be like, how could he? And then it would be like five, six in the morning. He'd come home and then I'd be like, your shit's outside. Was it uh, like neatly packed in something or just black thrown? garbage bags? Mm-hmm. Okay. It was like kinder than visual, the yeah, movies visual. is usually like scattered <sighs> clothes. And- yeah, I was picturing scattered all over the lawn. <laughs> no. And what happened then? We're still together. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got pregnant also. I mean, I I think it never really turned into anything. He always got he always just came back in and brought the bags back in the house. Oh, so you didn't change the locks or anything. I didn't change the locks or anything. No. Didn't barricade the door. Well, I didn't really want him gone. You know what I mean? That's the problem. That I think is the so difference between this guy in my previous situation. Yeah, this mm. guy sounds like he's done. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to be done to prove a point that it's not acceptable behavior, but I didn't really want to be done. It was just you're playing, a You were point. playing games. Yeah. No, I was just angry. She was proving a point. I was proving a point. Yeah. I was like point. doing the Beyonce thing. Would Everything you... you own in a box to the left. You know. What would Jeff have to do to, to get that right now? I think there's only one thing Jeff would have to do to get that. Sleep with the secretary? Yeah. That's it. That's it? Sleep with someone? Yeah. Anyone. Anyone. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the secretary. It could be anyone. If he cheated on her. That would be the only thing that would merit something like that. Do you think you could ever get over (sighs) him cheating on you? I don't. I really don't. No? Even, like, is there a circumstance or scenario in which, like, there's the drunken one night stand, and then there's so the we like, always argue about this. Yeah, and then there's the long term relationship or like secret fall in love. Oof! 
emotional. Oh, here we turned, go again. Sexual. We always argue about that. I know. We oh, she's. Oh, yeah. She, we're, we are aligned yeah. on this one, and, and you're, you're just you're like, done either way. Well, done. She's done if it's physical at all. But you're. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I. The question. Then I think is, Jeff would be done too. To be honest, like I don't think Jeff would tolerate that or forgive me if I did that. How far are you willing for an emotional relationship to go? Nowhere. I mean. I don't think, to me, like we've said, it's not as, that's not as damaging to me as sleeping with someone. Because How, how far would I have to go? Like f- flirting, him telling he, someone? He tells someone he's in love with them is not as damaging as sleeping with someone that he didn't care about. No, because to me, that's fantasy. So you're fine Like, I don't think that's a- real until you've consummated the... We so strongly so disagree on this. You'd be okay with the like. Fantasy. I would not be okay. Well, no, I know, with I know. It. You, you. But I'm like, just saying, one's more forgivable. To a me. meaningless doesn't have feelings for just literally the physical act is worse than him falling in love with someone else. There's meaning behind only, it. Just, like, There's no such thing as meaningless when he knows how deeply it would devastate me, and he made that choice. That is a very meaningful choice he made. That's not what. But what my example is literally like, let's say he was still drinking and not and d- not thinking about it and just or, did a or physical he act. He had a trip to Vegas. Sure. Relapse. Just not. Yeah. Nothing attached I mean, to it. Just a physical act. I'm not defending it because I'm not saying I'd be OK with that. But I'm just trying to prove the point that like. In that. No attachment. Circle. Yeah. No attachment. And I think is our. Point right. and physical one. Of yeah, it it's happens. hard for me to imagine because he doesn't drink. Like if he was drinking, I think anyone that's, I think anyone's capable of cheating. I don't think there's any such thing as like no. When people are like so and so would never, yeah. I'm like I don't buy that. I think right. everyone is capable of che- cheating, and I think if you add alcohol to the mix, everyone's even a little bit more capable. Mm. And so I take great comfort in the fact that he doesn't drink. Honestly, I don't know if I could even be in a relationship with him if he drank. We're just talking hypotheticals, though. Yeah, but yeah. hypothetically, if he drank, I wouldn't trust him as much. But you were with him for a long time while he was drinking. Yeah, and if he would go to Vegas and get drunk, I would get fucking pissed. Mm-hmm. Because it's not th- about him. I don't trust alcohol. And she's so hardcore about I certain know. things that you can't. There's no penetrating. Mm-mm. Well, the hard part is like, I hope I never have to deal with that. Right. Well, I mean, uh, I think we all hope we, we're, we don't. Yeah. Have to. So we're you'd, just, you'd, you'd think you'd move past it. I don't, I don't, I think the question was more, which one is, would be harder for you to get past. Which one would be harder for you? The emotional, like a, a longer term emotional one versus a like quick drunken fling. Which one do you think would be easier for you to have? Easier for me to have? Yeah. Like, which well, one could you see yourself either. Flip, like slipping into quicker? I think it would be easier for me to have an emotional affair yeah, yeah. than a physical one. I would too. I mean, but we're also both addict y mindsets. Yeah. I'm sure there's some like love addiction yeah. and relationship addiction that we both crave right what about you do you think it'd be easier for you to do emotional 100 uh-huh. percent. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she's like i'm in one right now i'm in one right now <laughs> this is a great comment for me because i'm not married so like i can't really answer yeah but you've been no, in I don't check out very fully. long-term committed serious relationships oh right so what what's the actual question would it be easier for you to fall into an emotional affair or a physical affair i think emotional well, I mean, I think that's for almost anyone. An emotional one is easier because it, it feels less. Yeah, it it's it's a much more gradual thing that would be mm-hmm. happening that you can make excuses for. Yeah. Versus like, I went to the bar and picked someone up, and then we went <laughs> into the bathroom. Like, those are very quick escalating steps. Yeah. To it versus like a friendship. Then slowly transforming into something more emotionally deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I think my biggest thing is yeah. because I, I really like prefer like an emotional connection if the physical is gonna 
happen as well. So it's not like I'm even someone that would. You wouldn't. You have would a never physical... connect with someone unless you're gonna fuck them. No, that's not <laughs> no, what the I'm other saying. Way, you would only have a physical relationship with someone if there was an emotional connection. <laughs> what I'm saying is that is my preference. Yeah. Emotional connection. Yeah. Yeah. Not mine. I'm not no, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying shit you can't, anymore. You're not allowed to say anything. I'm not saying allowed to say anything. Can I tell you guys something really quick before yeah. we go? We got this beautiful note saying that. Um, It was a girl saying that one of her friends had been struggling with something like a body issue or eating issue. And because of her listening for the past year to our podcast, she got so much more comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations and talking about things that people don't normally talk about, that she had the courage to talk to her friend about it. And now her friend's getting help. And she relates that back to the things that we bring up here and talk about. That is, that is the. Um, you better so you not stop. Get, so you otherwise, can't be quiet. I'm not yeah. gonna. Have I been quiet? Yeah. Oh. The last like three, four months. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'm not quiet, guys. I love you both. I love what we do here. I have to go pick up Briar. Yeah, we're love gonna you. do an episode next week about Rachel's relationships. Yeah. We're gonna do a deep dive and do. Uh, How much time do we have? Uh,